Uh, to start today, I'm very, very glad to be coming here, not because I'm going to be a speaker, but because our speaker this morning is going to be Nancy Soderberg. And uh, Nancy, just to give you a little background, she was the third highest ranking official at the United States National Security Council from 1993 to 1997. She served in the Clinton administration as the U.S. Representative for Special Political Affairs at the U.S. Mission to United, the United Nations as an ambassador. Uh, she was a key advisor to President Clinton in negotiating the peace process in Northern Ireland, and she also served as Deputy Director of President Clinton's National Security Transition in 1992, and as a Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to Senator uh, Edward Kennedy. Now, in the last few years, we have had the pleasure to have uh, uh, Ambassador Sorber, a distinguished visiting scholar at the University of North Florida. And today, I'm very proud to introduce her as our keynote speaker. Nancy. Good morning. How are you all? Um, yeah, I just brought some notes uh, here for the end of Good morning. Uh, I appreciate you all getting up early this morning and uh, joining us. And I want to, first of all, thank Parvez Ahmed for this great invitation to join you this morning. He's a real treasure to, to this community. And anytime he asks me to do something, I'll say yes. And I have to say it goes the other way, too. So thank you very much. It's a great. Um, and Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for your, your leadership in this conference. And I understand that you've had an incredible two days. Uh, you've had an arrange, amazing range of topics. I was looking at the program, and you've got fluent tickers appeal, the digital generation, the international contagion, moral capital control, Nigeria, China, Argentina, and even woody biomass supply change, which during the q and I want to know what that's about. So uh, what I thought I would do today is um, take about <coughs> Uh, half hour, 40 minutes or so to talk, and then say 15, 20 minutes for questions um, at the end. And I want to just take a minute to commend the Coggin College of Business um, for your extraordinary process. I see Jeff Michaelman back there. He deserves a round of applause for everything that you all have been doing there. But um, I really applaud you all and the um, the uh, Center for Sustainable Business Practices, with whom you've collaborated this year. Um, now in its 13th year, um, this International Business Research Conference includes participants from over uh, 50 countries and really provides scholars with the opportunity uh, to exchange ideas on business, politics, study abroad, um, and the whole, all of the challenges with the international uh, business. What I thought I'd do this morning is take you on a small tour of uh, the world's challenges and how you can kind of set a broader horoscope uh, for your own business planning. Um, I've had a little bit of experience in business and marketing. I run a small business uh, consulting firm and I ran for state senate last fall, which I loved. And um, one of my favorite stories from the campaign, Parvez has, has heard this, um, has to do with marketing. You put TV ads up and you get your messages out, and I just loved it. And one of my favorite parts of the campaign was a woman came up to me and said, oh, I've seen your ads, I really like your message, I'm going to vote for you. And she had a little boy with her, and I looked down and introduced myself to the boy, and he says, I, and I've seen your ads, and I said, well, do you know what a state senator does? And he puffed up his chest and said, yes, you approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't exactly the message I was trying to get out in my campaign, but uh, it's one of the challenges in business is how do you uh, shape that message for uh, your audience. Um, 
In terms of international business, um, all of you who are in business, I think, have a responsibility to send the message to your public representatives of the need to stay engaged. Um, we are part of a global environment today. If you have a website, you have an international business. Um, you are competing not only against other Americans, but uh, Chinese and Indians and uh, Malaysians all around the world. Um, the global challenges that we face today are critical and they're getting larger. Uh, we have just hit the seven billion population mark and by 2050 we're likely to have ten, nine or 10 billion. And that's gonna make global competition for resources more intense, uh, tougher, but also a bigger market in all those places. So all of a sudden you have New York, London, but also Beijing, Mumbai, Moscow, Sao Paulo. They're all major players, but they're also all major markets. So these are gonna require new plannings, new partnership, and careful execution. And how we manage these global challenges, the crush of poverty, nuclear bomb proliferation, terrorism, and cyber threats really matter. How we manage Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and a potentially nuclear Iran affects everyone. And so send that message in your businesses, to your communities. Um, I know a lot of Americans want to cut foreign aid and withdraw from the myriad challenges that we face. And believe me, some days I feel the same way. It'd be much easier just to step off the global economy. Uh, but here's the rub. All of us depend on the global economy. Uh, Florida in particular depends on trade and investments. Um, international trade accounts for nearly one out of five of Florida's jobs. Our export shipments last year totaled nearly $65 billion. And we need a prosperous world to ensure our own security. For instance, even in Europe, the debt crisis is far from over. And the failures in Europe are blowing back on our economy, not only making our partners weaker, but making our challenges tougher. It frankly doesn't cost that much. Foreign aid makes up 0.02%. Let me repeat that, 0.02%, about $50 billion. And it's one of the best ways to fight poverty and chaos in the countries and then develop strong democracies and the market economies uh, that follows. One of the key challenges today is in Afghanistan. Uh, when our troops depart in 2014, Afghan security forces are going to step up and take up the job of maintaining security. Uh, the question is whether the Taliban will be uh, returning to power through the ballot box, which is not an impossibility. The literacy rate there is only 28%, and women's literacy is less than half that. The opium trade provides 50% of the country's GDP, funding terrorism, criminals, and extremism. The best line I've heard on Afghanistan is a three-star general who served there told me a couple of years ago, we're wildly successful. We can leapfrog Afghanistan from the 14th to the 17th century. And it's a funny line, but it's an important goal to keep in mind. We're not trying to make a perfect 21st century economy in Afghanistan. We're trying to bring it out of the Middle Ages into at least the modern era. Um, and what, what, what we could do, we could get basic infrastructure, basic jobs, roads, and education, particularly for girls. We could transform the lives and put the country on a foundation that will be stable and means we don't have to reinvade Afghanistan. But it's gonna take an investment. It's gonna take the support of the American people to support that invest investment once our troops uh, leave. Now, society's development isn't gonna solve all of our problems. Certainly reigning in a nuclear Iran or North Korea will take a sophisticated mix of force and diplomacy. We don't know if our toughened sanctions will change the calculus in Tehran that it's not worth developing a nuclear weapon. North Korea is likely to remain a frustrating round of negotiations after negotiations where North Korea regularly cheats, ramps up a confrontation, and then we negotiate again. We're in the ramp up of tension right now with new threats for uh, attacking South Korea, a missile that might hit the United States in Alaska, or no or South Korea, Alaska, or Hawaii, and most likely, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there was a third nuclear test coming out of nuclear, nuclear North Korea. 
Um, and this cycle, as frustrating it is for anyone who's in office, um, is likely to continue so long as this dysfunctional dynasty clings to power. <coughs> Uh, one area that I'm particularly concerned about is uh, Pakistan. I would consider it the most dangerous place on earth. You've got a toxic mix of a weak civilian authority, nuclear weapons, a tense relationship with India with whom they've fought three wars, uh, and a safe haven for not only Taliban but the remnants of Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda remains a very dangerous threat, although I believe we're making headway. As you know, the absolute worst promotion you can get in the world is to go up the ladder of the ranks in Al-Qaeda because we will kill you. And that effort of, we call it whack-a-mole, you rise up and you get whacked, um, it really has decimated the Al-Qaeda leadership and its ability to maintain a sophisticated worldwide network. But that does not diminish the threat that remains. If you look at any of our intelligence reports that come out, Many of them are public, and you should follow them in your business. Um, they all say that the biggest threat we face is an Al-Qaeda or one of its affiliates gaining access to weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, or biological, and attacking the United States or our allies. Now, all of these threats out there, nuclear proliferation, terrorism, the global economy, um, sometimes they're so daunting, they want you to retreat, batten down the hatches, put up the walls around our two uh, borders. Uh, but we don't have that luxury. And we have to stay engaged, we have to fall, particularly since we're the lone superpower. What America does, and whether we lead or not, is often the determining factor on whether a problem gets solved. I'm a big believer in one of the best lines of President Kennedy, who said that I believe problems made by mankind can be solved by mankind. And in 2013, if we remain together, work hard, engaged, humankind can solve these challenges. And what I'll do is just take you on a quick tour around the world of some of the uh, international challenges that we face and then open it up to questions where due to end at 10 o'clock, so I'll make sure that we get out promptly so you stay on um, schedule. Uh, first of all, everyone's riveted by the events in Syria and the aftermath of the Arab Springs. And who would have ever thought that when, on January 4th, 2011, Mohammed Bouazizi, who is a fruit vendor in Tunisia, was told, when he was told by police authorities that he lacked a permit to sell fruit, set himself on fire igniting angry protests around the world uh, in Algeria, Jordan, Yemen, and Egypt, now in Syria. Uh, the democratic regimes have emerged in not only Tunisia, but also Egypt and in Libya. What I find interesting in this whole evolution is that there was one key player absent from the Arab Spring Revolution, Osama bin Laden. For all his rhetoric of he's going to take on the apostate, the non-believer Muslim regimes and create a revolution, none of the Arab youths in the street looked to Osama bin Laden. Not for inspiration, not for leadership, not for guidebooks, zero. He was absent and irrelevant. And to me, that marks the beginning of the end of Al-Qaeda as a global terror network. It simply does not have the support among the youth. And that's really good news. The bad news is that the Arab Spring could easily become an Arab winter. The Arab world is in a period of turmoil and change that will challenge the ability of the United States to influence events throughout the Middle East. And the turmoil is driven by forces that will shape Arab politics for years to come. And we don't know which way it's going to go includes a large youth population, economic grievances associated with persistent unemployment, inequality, corruption, increased popular participation and renewed hope in affecting the political change, and a greater ability by opposition groups to mobilize a nonviolent resistance on a large scale. But these forces propelling good change are confronting a tough, established problem. Ruling elites, sectarianism, ethnic and tribal divisions, lack of experience with democracy, dependence on natural resources such as oil for wealth, and regional power rivalries. And these Arab countries are undergoing a variety of contested transitions. 
and they're complex, protracted, they're going to have big ups and downs. The states where the authoritarian leaders have been toppled in Tunisia, in Egypt, and Libya, they're going to first have to reconstruct a political system through complex negotiations and competing factions. The protests you're seeing today in Egypt, in Libya, and Tunisia are a somewhat healthy but very difficult system. It's going to be up and down. It's not clear which way. I'm an optimist. I actually think it's going to move forward. Uh, but my attention right now is, is riveted on Syria, where regime intransigence and social divisions are prolonging an internal struggle with potentially uh, dramatic upheavals through the region. Now, the, President Obama has issued a directive uh, two years ago identifying prevention of mass atrocities and genocide as a core national security interest and a moral responsibility of the United States. But we have yet to act in Syria. 60,000 people have been killed in Syria. Nearly 800,000 refugees, nearly 5,000 people a day fleeing into the neighboring countries, creating destabilizing forces in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, the regions. And the main opposition leader yesterday opened up uh, the possibility of dialogue with Assad by offering unconditional discussions with him, uh, ask for an answer by tomorrow. Uh, my guess is it will be a flat no. Um, the diplomacy that by the UN has failed, the former Secretary General Kofi Annan has quit. My own view, unless we back up the diplomacy with force, perhaps a no-fly zone, the killing will continue and Assad will hang on to power. We also need Russia to take up a much stronger uh, leadership uh, position. But what you're seeing is a new reality in the Middle East, where such as in Turkey and Iraq, you could have a role for an Islamist-rooted parties in the political process and the Constitution, as long as they adhere to international standards of human rights and democratic principles. And we don't know yet how this story is going to unfold, but we do know that the United States must stay involved. As Hillary Clinton, the former Secretary of State, said, there are no one-size-fits-all solutions to these challenges. But there is one fundamental lesson that is universal throughout the Arab Spring and, frankly, the world, that reforms are essential. The United States has been calling for reform, but we need to do it more loudly and more strongly and get others to join in. We need reform not just for a political process, but a more open society, gender equality, and greater economic opportunities. Those are the pillars to progress in the region on which we must focus. Second, let me touch base on terrorism and security. There's an annual worldwide threat assessment that the Department of uh, the National Intelligence puts out, the new uh, Director of National Intelligence that was created after 9-11 to help us better connect the dots. It's public. It comes out every February. It's a great read, actually. It'll keep you up at night. It basically says, here are all the scary things going out there. But if you're into business and trying to navigate the choppy waters abroad, it's a really useful uh, tool. The most recent report states that counterterrorism, counterproliferation, cybersecurity, and counterintelligence are the immediate forefront of our security concerns. And they will be for the next, for, for our lifetime and probably your children's lifetime. That's a business opportunity. Think about it cyber, counterintelligence, counterterrorism. All of that is going to require new technology to address it. If you look at the war on terrorism, um, really it's a war on extremist groups around the world, primarily Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, but there are other ones throughout Asia and Africa. Uh, what we have to look at is how do you not prevent the tactic of terrorism, but how do we erode and destroy the ability of these groups to threaten us? Al-Qaeda is no doubt a threat, but I believe history is on our side. Our intelligence specialists expect that the next two to three years will be a critical transition phase for the terrorist threat facing the United States, what they call a global jihadist movement. And during this transition, we expect the leadership movement to become more decentralized because we decapitate the leadership and deny the safe havens. 
core Al Qaeda elements, which is essentially the Pakistani based led uh, group, is going to be diminishing in operational importance. Regional affiliates are going to be planning and attempting uh, terrorist attacks. And we'll have a more vigorous debate about how to uh, undermine their ability to have a global agenda. And there's a better than even chance, according to our intelligence assessments, that decentralization will lead to fragmentation of the Al-Qaeda movement within a few years. And with fra fragmentation, Al-Qaeda is likely to be a largely symbolic important movement with resonance in regional groups and to a lesser extent, small cells and individuals that will drive the jihadist agenda, both within here in the United States, we must not forget the homegrown problem and abroad. And here's a big threat, but it's also a big business opportunity. We have to be equally vigilant on the new systems of the threats to our cyber government, our cyber world, our cyber personal businesses, and our own entity, the entire world now works on the global internet. So we have to be able to connect the dots, track the financing, and get to the basic threats. Cyber threats pose a national and economic security concern. Uh, the terrorists and countries, uh, particularly Russia, France, China, um, have had continual advances and growing dependence on the ability to data collect, process, storage, transmission capable, all of these are increasingly at risk. Mobile, wireless, cloud computing, um, all are critical infrastructure targets for our terrorists. Um, innovation in uh, functioning to outpace these innovations of the terrorists are lagging. In other words, we are behind those threatening our cybersecurity and protecting ours. And this is a quote from the intelligence assessment that innovation in the terrorist piece is outpacing innovation in security. And quote, neither the public nor the private sector has been successful at fully implementing existing best practices. There's a business opportunity waiting uh, for someone to take up. Uh, cyber is now considered a major threat and we've even established a new combatant command to address it the Cyber Command. The targeted list includes a traditional battlefield prizes, command and control systems at military headquarters, air defense networks, and weapon systems that require computers to operate. And officials note that computer network warfare was evolving so rapidly that it was, there's a mismatch between our technical capabilities to conduct operations and the governing laws and practices. And they, uh, a threat, uh, the assessment is that the threat is going to increase in the coming years. Two of our greatest strategic challenges are one, the difficulty in providing timely, actionable warning of cyber threats, and two, assessing the highly complex vulnerabilities associated with the IT chain for all of the US and global networks. The US is trying to partner with the uh, private sector uh, to try and Bring the, you talk to anyone in the Pentagon right now and they're trying to compete with Silicon Valley for, for hiring the best and the brightest, giving them computers and say, okay, hack us. Um, and every time they do that, they find out that we are behind the hackers. Uh, next, let me touch base very quickly on nonproliferation and the environment. Um, as I said earlier, the biggest threat we face is that a terrorist network or individual could get access to weapons of mass destruction, biological, chemical, <coughs> Or, uh, or nuclear uh, weapons. Um, imagine the attacks of 9-11 had those planes been filled with chemical, biological, and much less a nuclear weapon. There would have been uh, millions affected, not just the 3,000 martyrs that we lost. Um, there is uh, one area, this is an area that uh, President Obama has really begun to develop a legacy. And he's committed to rebuilding a nonproliferation architecture that keeps us safe. Um, he's pledged to try and reduce the roles, role of nuclear weapons in there. He wants to get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, ratified and try and uh, strengthen the global architecture. Um, if I were to ask you what terrorist group had ever succeeded in um, using weapons of mass destruction to attack 
citizens. Can you think of any? Speak up in here. There are two, uh, where terrorists have attacked. One was the sarin gas attack in Japan in the mid-90s. What's the other one? The one in Russia, wasn't so good. Anthrax, exactly. Um, and that's it. It's kind of creepy they never found the person who did those anthrax right after 9-11 when the country was terrified and traumatized. They think it was an army scientist who committed suicide once they targeted them. The reason that it's so few is that there's a global architecture that keeps the fissile material weapons secure, that keeps chemical and biological weapons illegal and tries to have the IAEA inspecting those who have nuclear power plants to make sure that they don't reprocess the uranium or the, pl or the plutonium. Um, and that's how we caught Iran. And what you need to do is strengthen that uh, international uh, structure. Unfortunately, the network in uh, Washington is anti any kind of treaty like that. It took President Obama six months to get the New START Treaty uh, ratified a year and a half ago, uh, when all it did was lower nuclear weapons and reinstate the verification measures with, uh, with the Soviets. So what we need to do is make sure that we are vigilant and keep that international structure uh, secure. One of the scariest uh, out, uh, facts is that the Russians 60% of the Russian nuclear arsenal is vulnerable to attack or bribery. Um, and so far we've been lucky, frankly, that Al-Qaeda has not managed to do it. But we absolutely need to maintain that international architecture. Uh, let me say just a minute on energy, because I think this is uh, one of the huge business opportunities uh, for the next generation. Um, the United States is seeking to put America on a path to clean energy. Uh, would improve our energy security, reduce our fossil fuel effort, and drive an entire new generation of business innovation. Uh, the United States recognizes that we need to break from the old uh, way that threaten our economy and our planet, and the President has been investing $150, $150 billion in clean energy and research over the next 10 years. But we're falling behind the technology race. For instance, 15 years ago, the United States produced 40% of the world's solar panels, 40%. But by 2008, that share had fallen to just 5%. Now, we're, the government is investing more in that. We're on track to get up to 10%, but we ought to be leading that race. A few, a few years ago, we had the um, capacity to make less than 2% of the world's advanced vehicle batteries, but in the next five years, will make 40% of these batteries here in the United States, and that's the way of the future. We have to lead our way off the dependency on fossil fuels. The revolution in natural gas and the new technology is giving us a huge respite in that, tra in that track, and we have more time than we thought we did. America is um, now going to, has the chance of becoming a net exporter, uh, but in the long run, we have to make sure that we have renewable sources of energy. Uh, climate change is a global threat, and we need much bolder international action. Um, we must have a, uh, a sense of urgency about this, and frankly, the fossil fuel industry-driven skeptic campaign has worked. The urgency has gone. The international action has stalled. Um, I think President Obama mentioning the, the need for climate change in his State of the Union address has given people new hope that they'll have U.S. leadership to ensure that global emissions peak and begin to decline in 2015. That's only two years away. There's also hope of getting a binding global agreement that would be setting those standards and requiring a new deal that includes China and India. There's a new Green Climate Fund uh, establishing $100 billion annually by 2020 for mitigation and adaptation. And while that may not be real, yet with, st with strong leadership from a second newly re-elected uh, President Obama in his second term could well begin to push for it. Um, as I mentioned, China and India will absolutely be part of that deal. Um, when we did the deal before, China and India were not the 
uh, major polluters when the standard was set in 1990. Today they are. A couple of years ago, China passed us as the largest global emitter of greenhouse glasses. And if we fail to address climate change, we will remain at risk not only from global warming, but also from a continued dependence on our unstable energy uh, suppliers. Um, I will note just briefly uh, a new challenge. It's the global, wa global water challenge. Uh, and those of you who are looking for new fields to get into, how to manage the global water supply, particularly when you look at the shortages we have today and the fact that we're going to have another two to three billion people on Earth within the next uh, couple of decades. Um, we actually have almost three billion people already living in areas of high stress. Um, and it's likely to get to 4 billion by 2030. By that time, water scarcity could cut the world's harvest by 30%, equal to all the grain grown in the U.S. and India, as human numbers and appetites increase. Some 60% of Chinese cities are already short of water. The Yellow River is now left with only 10% of its natural flow. The glaciers of the Himalayas, which act as giant water banks supplying 2 billion in Asia, are melting. And meanwhile, devastating droughts are crippling to, uh, Australia and parts of the United States. Water shortages are already beginning to contain economic growth in areas such as California, China, Australia, India, Indonesia. Water is also the base of conflicts in the Middle East, Haiti, Sri Lanka, Colombia, the, the uh, Central Asia countries. And we are way behind the curve on this. And so it's an absolute future um, leader's uh, challenge for you looking at business opportunities. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to say one uh, plug uh, for those of you who are looking at sustainable development. Uh, there is often a major overlooked uh, challenge in American foreign policy and the world's uh, leadership. Um, often, uh, we leave out half of the population in trying to solve our challenges. We do not involve our women in today's challenges. They're marginalized. If you look at, in the U.S., fewer than 4% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. 64% of the minimum wage jobs are held by women. That imbalance is even worse around the world, where the majority of women are the poor, the uneducated, the unhealthy, the unfed. Women are a majority of the world's farmers, but are often forbidden to own the land they cultivate or have access to credit, which makes the farms profitable. They care for the world's sick, but the women and girls are less likely to get treatment if they are, are sick themselves. Women rarely cause armed conflicts, but often suffer the consequences. And violence against women, which surfaces as domestic violence, rape, conflict, child marriage, honor killings, um, so sex selective abortions, and much more. Uh, it has become a global pandemic of women against violence. What does it matter, really, if women get to play second fiddle forever? There's no guarantee that life's supposed to be fair, right? If you look at the world and it was running okay, you'd say, well, maybe it doesn't matter. But we have some huge messes out there. And the research over and over has shown that when women are free to vote and run for public office, governments are more effective and responsive to their people. When women are free to earn a living and start small businesses, they drive more economic growth. Women, women go back to school, get health care, their families and communities prosper. And when women have equal rights, the nations are more stable, more peaceful, and more secure. I'm not saying that women are better than men. We all know that. There are wonderful men, all of whom are in this room, and appalling women, of course, none of whom are here this morning. Um, but leaving out of women out of the formal economy means you have a half-powered economy. The opposite is true. You bring them in, educate them and their children, and the country prospers. Bringing women into negotiating discussions, they help end civil wars and build a sustainable peace. I've seen it myself, negotiating peace around the world. In Northern Ireland, it was the women that was on the forefront. In Liberia today, it's the women that are building it from ground um, up. So I would ask you to leave you with a thought this morning of think about how you can help give women a leg up. 
And I don't mean bring one or two as in tokens. How can we show that we're grooming women to reach the top level? So that our, our representatives in Congress are 50-50, so that the CEOs are 50-50. So get smart, energetic, and ambitious about helping women. Look at them as energies that can fit your needs. Listen to their concerns, move barriers out of the way, and be as creative as possible in getting women to the table in every aspect of your project. And finally, mentor women. Men naturally seem to support each other. They golf together, they go to drink beer together. Women are just too busy to do that often. And women sometimes view each other as a threat, or they're just not having time to think about it. But we all need to do it, both men and women. I was lucky enough to have the wonderful woman named Madeleine Albright as my mentor in, uh, in graduate school. And we've helped each other along the way. And she has one of the best sayings. May it be a hot day in hell for women who refuse to help other women. And she has spent the rest of her life trying to run a business, but also to really um, help women. And here at UNF, I'm honored to run a, a mentoring program to get kids into public service. And it's one of the favorite things that I do. I have an international business and travel and do Washington foundations and business. But the most impressive um, achievement that I put in my, a feather in my cap is the hundreds of students that I've helped a leg up. Uh, and the one thing I've asked them to do when they ask me how they can thank and this mentor uh, the next UNF, um, UNF uh, kids. So uh, let me stop there. And we've got about uh, a little over 15 minutes for questions. I'll repeat the question so I can hear it. I'm going to be able to summarize only short. I'm going to, you're going to lose me. What's your question? No, it's not a question, but just kind of saying that in the summer, the way I got from you, that you have the ideas, Okay. Uh, to summarize, that he agreed with everything I said. Um, <laughs> but it was, it's all about ideas, and you need institutions and ideas um, in terms of. Uh, uh, getting things going, but you also need leadership. Uh, I talked about Egypt and also the, the young woman in Pakistan who was uh, shot in the head on a bus by the Taliban and um, has been actually recovering. It's amazing um, for advocating women's education, girls. question is, why are they still some terrorists? We're sick of them, and... There is more, I was going to say. For instance, Bin Laden would not have been there if he had resolved the Palestine problem. I 
mean, this is so stupid. We just deal with the uh, reaction to the uh, what is happening rather than solving the problem. You guys hear it? What can we do? Okay. What can we do? Um, well, there's two questions there. One is, why is there terrorism? Who is there? The, the good news about the terrorist threat is, first of all, there'll always be terrorism. Terrorism is a tactic where people are going to blow stuff up. The most dramatic one before 9-11 was when Timothy McVeigh decided he was going to blow up the Oklahoma City uh, federal building, kill women and children working there uh, in retribution for the FBI's attack on Waco. So that it's not going to go away, but we can minimize it. The global jihadist threat is essentially uh, best estimates that I've seen is Al Qaeda is down to about 50 people uh, living mostly somewhere in Pakistan with eroding capacity to create a global network. Um, even at their height, there were maybe 2,000 on the inner circle and maybe another 30,000 operatives. Out of 7 billion people, I don't call that a global movement. It's deadly, it's threatening. Um, there's other Islamic ones around the world. There are non-Islamic terrorism as well. Um, in Japan, uh, there's a few left in Ireland. Uh, the Basques have stopped blowing things up, but they're still classified as a terrorist organization. The US Is it still there? Okay. Um, the US actually puts out a global list of foreign terrorist organizations. There's about 43 on them. It's fascinating. They update it every year. It's a foreign terrorist organization. Um, but the reason that you have terrorists is not what you always think, uh, which, oh, they're poor and they're mad at the leadership of the United States. The 19 hijackers on 9 11 were actually middle class, fairly wealthy people. Bin Laden was the sum of a, uh, a Yemeni. Uh, construction magnate who made his absolute fortune in, um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's a couple levels of it. One, I would say there's sort of uh, on the, the Al Qaeda and the, the Al Qaeda network is driven largely by um, a dysfunctional Arab regimes where you have extreme wealth at the top. Um, power largely controlled by the princes in the family, not shared if you're not a member of the royal family, um, and no, no hope of getting to be part of the central power, which I would define as leadership in government and a share of the wealth if you're not part of that family. That has to change. That's what drives a lot of the extremists in the Middle East. Now, to answer your question on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, I couldn't agree more with you that we need to do more to try and solve it. But don't link the Palestinian-Israeli conflict with 9-11. 9-11 was planned when the President of the United States was doing absolutely everything he could to give the Palestinians a state through negotiations with, um, with uh, first Isaac Rabin, who was assassinated, and then um, a variety of other Israeli leaders leaving to the Tabo Accords, failure in 2001 with uh, Ehud Barak. The Palestinian solution is clear. You're going to have two states. You're going to have Israel um, and Palestine in essentially the 1967 uh, borders percentage-wise. You're going to have land swaps to make up some of the settlements. Uh, you're going to have a contiguous land. Refugees are not going to go back to Israel proper, but those who have land there will get compensated and others can go back to the Palestinian. That's the deal. It's just a question of when the political leadership is going to be ready to stand up. I don't think that President Obama has done enough in the last four years to try and do this. Um, George Bush did nothing in the eight years he was in office, and Clinton went out trying as hard as he could and through his entire presidency. At some point, you're going to need leadership both in Israel and in the Palestinian community. I think what's happening in the Palestinian community is fascinating. I thought it was actually a good idea that the Palestinians were applying for statehood at the UN. It's better than a third intifada. I thought we made a mistake in saying, great, go for it. Let's negotiate the... the the borders. Um, but it's a good sign that they're trying to develop institutions and negotiations rather than resorting to attacking Israel. Hamas in itself is a terrorist organization in control of Gaza that has been lobbing weapons, uh, rockets into the Israeli uh, population, killing a dozen or so. That doesn't help foster peace there. And even in Hamas, they're talking about negotiating their 
talking about unifying with the Palestinians. Um, so you can't blame everything on the United States. The Israeli government has made it very clear that there's no peace movement there and they're not interested. They just are building settlements with a band that's creating all sorts of tension. It's a tinderbox that fuels, not Al-Qaeda, frankly. Al-Qaeda uses it as rhetoric, but they've never done a thing. They actually help the Palestinians. They're so I think in terms of moving it forward, um, it's not all the United States' fault. Ultimately, the leaders are going to have to come up and develop a process of negotiations leading to that. And I, I think you're almost going to need a generational shift, both in Israel and in the, among the Palestinian leaders, before you get that. But I think certainly you may see more leadership from President Obama on this. Uh, the question is, why is there less and less belief in institutions? Congress is at an all-time low. People were frustrated by Palestinian, I mean, the Kyoto Protocol, what was the other one you mentioned? The, the UN. And the UN. Um, first of all, the, the UN is actually quite popular. If you listen to Fox News, you'd think it was about to take us over and invade our schools and take our guns. Um, but the American public are smarter than that, and they actually, when you do polling on the UN, um, it, it comes up 70%, they kind of like it. Um, most people get mad at the UN because it hasn't solved Syria, for instance, and I, I teach here at UNF, and I always ask the students, well, what are the top three things you want the UN to do? And I say, well, look at one of the P5 and see who's objecting to it. If one of the P5 objects to it, the P5, for those of you who don't speak UN language, is the permanent members of the Security Council, the US, UK, France, Germany, I mean, France, Russia, and China. Um, and so I try and say, you know, part of the reason it doesn't solve all today's problems, but I ask you, you know, who's flown internationally lately and why if you go to China, doesn't the pilot have to speak Chinese? Or if you go to Latin America, they don't have to speak French. It's because the UN runs an entire system of air traffic uh, around the world, a global system for sea navigation. They've eradicated polio, uh, smallpox, um, almost. Um, you know, I, I talked to the kids here, all of us, not everybody here is my age, but more or less, that most of us have had a smallpox vaccination, either on your arm or on your leg. You don't have that unless you're born in a developing country or served in the military. That's because of the UN. So the UN is actually doing okay. Um, half the world is democracy, is democratic, the other half's not. And it's the half that's not that slows down the UN. Um, Congress is very low in appeal, rightly so, in my view. Um, they've been taken over by extremists. The Tea Party, in my own view, is on its way down. It has, um, it, I love the energy of the Tea Party, that they have activists and they're organized, but they have zero solutions. They do not believe in facts, it's all rhetoric. And it's been fueled by Fox News. That if you notice Fox News, it's really moderating its, itself. I mean, they, Fox News gave Glenn Beck and um, I forget the other guy's name, who would like rail on immigrants nonstop, 24 hours a day. And what happened in the last election? Ooh, we like immigrants. We're going to get immigration reform. We need that 70% that voted for Obama to come over. So. Americans are very centrist, and the pendulum will swing back, I think, where you'll have even the Tea Party in Congress having to deal with some facts. They're going to get immigration reform. Um, the other thing I think you have to remember is only bad news makes news. I can remember when I was working at the White House, we were doing all this great stuff, and I'd call up my reporter friends, and like, well, why aren't you reporting? We solved this problem, we did that, we prevented that crisis. They said, well, it's not news. Oh, okay. So it's, it's also, I think, a um, responsibility of citizens to inform themselves and actually read, turn off some of the more ridiculous talk shows, um, and look at what, what's really happening. Um, I also think it's partly driven 
uh, by an economic downturn. Um, anytime you have an economic downturn, you can document this throughout history, um, people become isolationist, they become more racist, they want to shut out immigrants, they want to close and hunker down and just protect their tribes. Um, and that's what we've gone through in the last decade. And I think we're coming out of it, so you'll see it become much better. The facts do end up eventually emerging. And some of those facts I talked to you initially about in my talk, um, it's an interconnected global world with almost, you know, soon to be nine to 10 billion people. Any one of you who goes into business, you're gonna to have to deal with the, inter the, the rest of the world, and so too will America. And ultimately, I think it'll swing back. And you're seeing actually a very healthy discussion about the isolationist movement in this country. Like, now we just got a clock to clean. Let's see what we need to do more. As to watch, watch the debate within the Republican Party right now, it's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating to see what they're gonna do. I had a couple in the back here, and I've got uh, five minutes left, so I'll take two at a time, and then try and get to everybody. I've got you, 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 and you, and then, was there somebody back there? Yeah. Yes. Let's try you two first, and then I'll, I'll try and get through the rest of them. Okay. Um, it's a quick uh, question. Uh, it's just for uh, clarification. Uh, Patriot, uh, I am a U.S. citizen. I am a Jordanian origin from the Middle East. I'm from where? From, the, from Jordan. Jordan, okay. He said he just has a comment. He's from Jordan. I am a, a citizen. So and a citizen. So nobody can question my loyalty to this country. Okay. Uh, first of all, when we promise, I mean, if I promise my son, for example, something that younger son, and I don't fulfill the promise, then next time he will not listen to me. George Bush, George W. Bush, when he started the war in Iraq, he promised that Iraq will be the example and the, for the Middle East and the world in democracy, right? And after 11 years, we see all destruction in Iraq. Second, uh, why do you do what we did for Libya, Libyan people in Syria, instead of just sitting and crying for the people when they are getting killed every day. Let me stop there because I'm not going to be able to remember everything. Um, he's saying that if he basically tells his son he's going to do something and doesn't do it again, and doesn't do it, he's not going to trust him. Why did George Bush promise democracy in Iraq and not deliver it? And what was the last one? And the second one, why we don't do the same thing we did for Libya? Oh, sick. for Libya, and why don't we do what we did in Libya for Syria? I'm going to ask you to finish in the next 10 seconds because we've got three other people. And, and the third one, which is very important, okay, we know as a United States that the source of fundamentalism and the producer, okay, is Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, okay? They are the teacher. They are the, 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 and the exporters of extremism are Saudi Arabia. So, I agree with so you. Then why? So it is allies to the United States, the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia country. So why Saudi do we have an alliance? When, when, okay, final ten so seconds. Why do we take measures against this country in order to put limit for this fundamentalism? So why don't we put limits on Saudi Arabia to stop this increase in fundamentalism? Yeah, uh, I'm going to piggyback on what Saurav said because I don't know if um, it was received or maybe I misunderstood. It, it seems like the United States puts up institutions and processes and sometimes when people follow the process but the end result is not what we expect it to be, um, such as elections, free elections, and they elect a Hamas-led you know, sometimes the end result might not be there, even though we try the process and then we go back and we try to circumvent the process. I think a little bit that's what Sarab was saying. And the second thing is more of a kudos to you. I'm a management professor, and one of the things research says about women in management is that they make horrible mentors. Many times because they have not been mentored themselves, they've had to scratch and claw their way all the way to where they're at, and they kind of figure others do. So kudos to you for um, for trying to change that, and I hope it changes in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, a lot of women see other women as a threat because they're used to being the only other woman in a room. Their cat claws come out with another, and it's just really, really unhealthy. So I think that the next generations, it's a little less like that, but it's, it's really important to see that. Um, to your question, on the Saudis, uh, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, and there's one word of why we don't do it, and it's OIL, 
oil. And that comes back to what I was saying about the need to get off our dependence on Saudi and Venezuelan oil. This natural gas boom is really interesting. Um, and it's going to get us to think, hey, we could maybe develop a, a, a different route here. I haven't quite analyzed. Some of you may have what's going to happen with it, but it's absolutely fascinating. We need to push them harder. We made a deal with the Arab world in the 70s that if you keep a stable, cheap source of oil coming to us, we will stay out of your internal business. And that deal ended on 9-11, and we haven't changed our policies sufficiently. So that's one of the big challenges ahead. Uh, I have two questions here, and then I will uh, close. Opportunity, billions and billions of government contracts. Right, but it's just it's, private. it's so pricey, and it wasn't set up right to begin with. It's, I think it's going to take a long time before that project is completed, and if it ever is. Did you guys hear that? He's basically saying that the infrastructure. He's a logistics major here, and um, the infrastructure for the natural gas was not set up right. So it's going to be billions and billions before you can actually get it functioning, and, and quite a long time. So I guess. It's not going to be necessarily the big boom everybody